I want to make this recording of an excerpt from the first book my mother read to me from in this series, the Red Wall series. It's the prequel to that book, Mossflower. And I wanted to read this so that I could honor the memory of this well-written book, but also the memory of my mother reading it. Um, so here we go. Um, late autumn winds sighed fitfully around the open gatehouse door rustling brown gold leaves in the fading afternoon. Bella of Brookhall snuggled deeper into her old armchair by the fire. Through half-closed eyes she watched the small mouse peering around the doorway at her. Come in, little one, and close the door. The small mouse did as he was bidden. Encouraged by the badger's friendly smile, he clambered up into the arm of the chair and settled himself against the cushion. You said you would tell me a story, Miss Bella. The badger nodded slowly. Everything you see about you, the harvest that has been gathered from the russet apples to the golden honey, is yours to enjoy in freedom. Listen now, as the breeze sweeps the last autumn leaves off into the world of winter, I will tell you of the time long ago, before Redwall Abbey was built in Mossflower. In those days there was no freedom for woodlanders, for we were oppressed cruelly under the harsh rule of a dog, uh, Green Eyes and his daughter Salmina. It was a mouse like yourself that saved Mosflower. His name is known to all, Martin the Warrior. Ah, my little friend, I am grown old, and so are my comrades. Their sons and daughters are fathers and mothers now, but that is life. The seasons still look new to young eyes. The food tastes fresher in the mouths of the young ones than it does in my own. As I sit here, it warms in peace. It all lives again in my memory. A strange tale of love at war, friend and foe, great happenings and mighty deeds. Gaze into the fire, everyone. Moss flower lay deep in the grip of mint winter, beneath a sky of leaden gray that showed tinges of scarlet and orange on the horizon. A cold mantle of snow draped the landscape, covering the flatlands to the west. Snow was everywhere, filling ditches, drifting high against hedgerows, making paths invisible, smoothing the contours of earth in its white embrace. The gaunt, leafless ceiling of moss flower wood was penetrated by the constant snowfall, which carpeted the sprawling woodland floor, building canopies on evergreen shrubs and bushes. Wind had muted the earth. The shuffled stillness was broken only by a traveler's pause. A sturdy, young mouse, with quick dark eyes, was moving confidently across the snowbound country. Looking back, he could see his tracks disappearing mount northward into the distance. Further south, the flatlands rolled off endlessly, flanked to the west by the faint shape of distant hills, while the west toward the long, ragged fringe marking the marches of Mosflower. His nose twitched at the elusive smell of burning wood and turf from solemn hearth fire. Cold winds sowed from the treetops, causing whirls of snow to dance in icy spirals. The traveler gathered his ragged cloak tighter, adjusting an old rusting sword that was slung across his back, and trudged steadily forward, away from the wilderness, where the other creatures lived. It was a forbidding place made mean by poverty. Here and there he saw signs of habitation, the dwellings ravaged and demolished made pitiful shapes under the snowdrifts. Rearing high against the forest, a curious building dominated the ruined settlement. A fortress, crumbling, dark and brooding, it was the symbol of fear to the wooden creatures of Mosflower. This is how Martin the Warrior first came to Gautier, place of the Wally Cats. In a mean hovel on the south hide of Gautier, the Stickle family crunched around a low turf fire, it gusted fitfully as the night winds pierced the slatted timbers where mud chinking had not replaced. A timid scratch at the door caused him to jump nervously. Ben Stickle picked up a bill of firewood, motioning his wife and Goody to keep their four little ones well back in the shadows as the good wife Stickle covered her brood with coarse burlap blankets. Ben took a firmer grip on the wood and called out harshly in his gruffest voice. Be off with you and leave us alone. There's not enough food to go around to feed a dozen hedgehog families. 
You have already taken all we have to swell the lasers and culture. Ben, Ben, this oil was claw. Open up, bro. This is freezing out here. As Ben Stickle opened the door, a homely faced mole trundled by him and hurried across to the fire, where he stood rubbing his digging claws together in front of the flames. The little ones peeped out from underneath the blankets. Ben and Goody turned anxious faces toward the fugitive. Urskola rubbed warmth from his calm glow as he talked into the curious, rustic mole speech. Vermin patrols be out. Burr wheedled and stoats and a loik. Them are loikin for more than vittles. Goody shook her head as she wiped the little one's snout on their apron. I knew it! We should have run off and left this place like the others. Where in the name of Spikes will we find money to pay their tolls? Ben stickled through the piece of firewood despairingly. Where can we run in midwinter with four little ones? They'd perish long before spring. Earth's claw produced a narrow strip of silver birch bark and held a paw to his mouth, indicating silence. Scratched on the bark and charcoal was a single word, Corin. Beneath it was a simple picture map showing a rock, the moss flower woods, all from Corin. Ben studied the map torn by the chance of escape and his family's predicament. The frustration was clear on his face. Bang, bang. Open up. In there. Come on, get this door open. This is official Cotter Patrol. Soldiers. Ben took one last hasty glance at the strip of bark and threw it on the fire. As Goody lifted the latch of the door that was thrust forcefully inward, she was swept to one side as the soldiers packed the room out of the window night show. They pushed and they shoved at each other roughly. A ferret named Blacktooth and a stoat named Spitnose seemed to be in charge of the patrol. Ben Stickle sighed with relief as they turned away from the burning strip of bark and stood with their backs to the fire. Well now, dozy spikes, where are you hiding all the bread and cheese and October ale? Ben could scarcely keep the hatred from his voice as he answered the sneering Blacktooth. It is many a season since I tasted cheese or October ale. There's bread on the shelf, but there's only enough for my family. Split nose spat into the fire and reached for the bread. Ben Stick was blocked from stuffing a stoat by a barrier of steel hafts as he tried to push forward. Goody placed a restraining paw on her husband's spikes. Please, Ben, don't fight him. The great bullies. Earth Claw chimed in. You're Ain't much you could do against spears, Ben. Blacktooth turned to the mole as if seeing him for the first time. Huh? What you doing here, Blink Eye? One of the little hedgehogs threw the sackling aside and faced the stoat boldly. He came in for a warm by a fire. You leave him alone. Spitnose spread out laughing, spraying crumbs from the bread he was eating. Look out, Blackie. There's more of them under that black and I would watch out if I were you. A nearby wheel threw back the covering, exposing the three little ones. Blacktooth sized them up. Hmm, they look big enough to do a day's work. Good night, Stickle. Sprang fiercely in front of them. You leave my little ones be. They ain't hardened nobody. Blacktooth seemed to ignore her. He knocked the loaves from Spittooth's paws, turning up a weasel as he issued orders. Pick that bread up and no sly munching. Deliver it to the stores when we get back to the garrison. Waving his spear, he signaled the patrol out of the hut. As Blacktooth left, he called to Ben's goody. I want to see those four hogs out in the fields tomorrow. Either that, or you can spend all the rest of the winter safe and warm in Carter's dungeon. Earth clock an eye to the crack on the door, watching the patrol make its way around Carter. Ben wasted no time. He began wrapping the young ones in the blankets they possessed. Right, that's it. Enough is enough. We go tonight. You're right, old girl. We should have left to live in the woods with the rest a long time ago. What you say, Earthclaw? The mole stood with his eye pressed against the crack of the door. Yer, come here, look at this. While the Ben shared the crack with his friend, Goody continued her swapping her long ones. With the blankets. What is it, Ben? They're not coming back, are they? No, wife. Ho, ho, ho. Look at that, by hokey. 
see the punch he landed on that weasel's nose. Go on, give it to him, Rado. Ferdy, the little one who had spoken up, scuttled over and tugged at Ben's paw. Punch? Who punched the weasel? What's happening? Ben described the scene as he watched it. It's a mouse. Big strong fella, too, he is. They're trying to capture him. That's it. Now kick him again, mouse. Go on. Ha ha. You'd think a couple of troll full of soldiers could handle a mouse, but not this one. He must be a real trained warrior. Whew. Look at that. He's knocked Blue flat on his back. Pretty dear, hanging on to his sword like that. By the spikes, he's caused much damage if he had that blade between his paws, rusty as it is. Ferdy jumped up and down. Let me see, I want to look. Earthclaw turned slowly from the door. Ain't much use, little edge pig. They're gonna grow him down now. I roped them up too. Oh, what a pity. They were too many for him to fight. For he'd be a grave, brave warrior too. Ben was momentarily crestfallen. Then he clapped his paws together. Now is the time. While this patrol is busy with the fighter, they've got a job on their paws. Dragging them back to the cat's castle. Come on, let's get going with the going's good. A short while later, the fire was burning to embers and an empty hut as the little band trudged from the vast woodland sprawl of moss flower, blinking water from their eyes as they kept their heads down against the keen wind. Earthclaw followed up the rear, obliterating the paw tracks from the snowy ground. Chapter 2 Muff the mouse thief padded silently across the passage from the larder and stone room for Potter. He was a plump little creature, clad in a green jerkin with a broad buckled belt. He was a ducker and a weaver of life, a marvelous mimic, ballad writer, singer, and lockpicker, and very jovial to it all. The woodlanders were immensely fond of the little thief. North struggled it all off calling every creature his matey in meditation of the author, who he greatly admired. Chucking quietly to himself, he drew the small dagger from his belt and cut off a wedge from the cheese he was carrying. Slung around his shoulder was a large flask of elderberry wine, which he had also stolen from the larder. North ate and drank, singing quietly to himself in a deep bass voice, with mouthfuls of cheese and wine. The Prince of Mouth Thief honors you to visit here this day. So keep your order door shut tight and lock all your food away. Oh foolish ones, go check your store of food so rich and fine. Be sure that I'll be back for more, especially this wine. At the sound of heavy paws, Moth fell silent. Melting back into the shadows, he huddled down and held his breath. Two weasels dressed in armor and carrying spears trudged past. They were arguing heatedly. Listen, I'm not taking the blame for your stealing from the larder. Who, me? Be careful what you say, mate. I'm no thief. Well, you're looking very fat lately, that's all I can say. Huh, not half as pudgy as you, you lard barrel. Lard barrel yourself, you'll be accusing me next. Ha! Ah, you're in charge of the keys, so who else could it be? It could be you. You're always down there when I am. And I can only go down to keep an eye on you, mate. I only go down to keep an eye on you, so there. Right. So we'll keep an eye on each other then. Ruff snuffed the paw in his mouth. He definitely gave it. The weasel stopped. What was that? Oh, I know what it was. You're laughing at me. Ah, oh, don't talk stupid. Talking stupid, am I? Indignantly, the weasel turned from his companion. Moth quickly called out in a passable weasel voice, imitation. Big fat robber! The two weasels turned furiously upon each other. Big fat robber, take that! Ouch, you sneaky toad! You take this! These weasels sacked away and madly at each other with their spear handles. Moth sneaked out of hiding and crept off into the opposite direction, leaving the two guards rolling upon the passage floor, their spears forgotten as they bit and scratched each other. Ow! Let it go! Oh, take that! I'll give you, Robert, some of this! Ow! You bit my ear! Seizing his back and shaking with mirth, North unlatched a window shutter and slipped away through the snow towards the woodland. Oh, fight, lad, fight! Scratch, lad, bite! North will dine on cheese and wine when he gets home tonight. 
Martin dug his heels into the sand, skidding as he was dragged bodily through the outer wall gates of the forbidden heap he had sighted earlier that day. Armored shoulders clanked and clattered together as they were dragged inward by the ropes that restrained the prisoner, none of them wanting to get too close to the fighting mouse. Blacktooth and Spitnose closed the main gates with so much tempered slamming. Powdery snow blew down on them from the top of the perimeter wall. The parade ground snow was hammered flat and slippery by soldiers drastic hither and thither, some carrying lighted torches, ferrets, weasels, and stones. Some of them called out to Spitnose, Hot, spitty, any sign of the fox out there? The stoat shook his head. What, you mean the hailer? No, not a whisker. We caught a mouse, though. Look at this thing he was carrying. Spitnose waved Martin's rusted sword aloft. Blacktooth ducked. Stop playing with that thing, you flash somebody twirling it around like that. So, they're waiting on the facts again, are they? Old Green Eyes doesn't want waiting on that fox again. Seems getting better anyway. Hey, you there. Keep those ropes tight. Don't even still, you block. The entrance hall proved doubly difficult as the warrior mouse clung, clung to the timber doorpost. The soldiers had practically to pry him loose from with their spears. The weasel, who had been given charge of the bread, kept well out of it, heading directly from the storeroom and larder. As he passed through the entrance hall, he was challenged by others who cast covetous eyes upon the brown home baked loaves. It had been a hard winter. Many creatures had deserted the settlement around Carter during the early autumn harvest, taking with them as much produce as they could carry to the woodland. There was not a great deal of toil or levy coming in. The wheel clutched the bread was close as he padded along. The hall was hostile and damp, with wooden shutters across the low window. The floor was made from a dark granite-like rock, very cold in the pores. Here and there, the nighttime guard had lit small fires in corners, which stained the walls black with smoke and ashes. Only captains were allowed to long, long cloaks as mark of rank, with several soldiers draped themselves in old sacks and blankets were loined from the settlement. The soldiers, down to the lower levels, were a jumble of worn spirals and stairs and flights of stone steps in no particular sequence. Half the wall torches had been burned away had not been replaced, leaving large areas of the stairs dark and dangerous. Moss of fungus grew on most of the lower level walls and stairs. Hurrying along a narrow passage, the weasel banged on the storeroom door. A key turned in the lock. What you got there? Lord, eh, bring them in. The two guards had been fighting and were sitting on flour sacks. One of them eyed the bread hungrily. Huh, is that all you got tonight? I'll tell you, mate. Well, weird things are getting bad to worse around here. Who sent you down with them? Back to it. Oh, him. Did you count them? Oh, no, I don't think so. Look, there's five loaves. We'll have half a loaf each. That'll leave three and a half. Nobody will notice the difference. They tore hungrily at goody stickles, oven brown loaves. Upstairs, Martin had managed to wrap one of the ropes around a stone column. Soldiers were jeering at the efforts of the patrol to get him away and up at the stairs. Ah, what's the matter, lads? Are you scared of him? Blacktooth turned on a mocking group. Hey, you lot fancy having a go at him? Oh, I thought not. The door opened behind them and snow blew with a wool, cold, windy, draughty gust. A fox wearing a ragged cloak trotted past them and up the broad, flat stairs to their first floor. The soldiers found a new target for the remarks. Oh, ho! Just you wait, Fox. You're late. I, old green eyes, don't like to be kept waiting. I'd keep out of Lady Samin's way if I were you. Ignoring them, the fox swept quickly up the stairs. Martin tried to make a dash for the half open door with the parade ground, but he was still carried to the door by the weight of the number. Still, he fought gamely on. The cheering soldiers started shouting, calling, humor and advice again. Blacktooth turned, freezing them into silence with a stern glance, but they took no notice of him this time. Spitnose sniffed in disgust. 
discipline has gone to the wall since the Lady Rock was getting sick. Fortunata's eviction waited nervously in the draughty anti-hall quarter. A low fire cast its guttering light around the damp stone wall. Slimy green algae and fungus grew between sodden banners as they slowly disintegrated into threadbare tatters dispensed by rusty iron holders. The vixen could not suppress a shudder. Presently she was joined by two ferrets, dressed in cumbersome and chainmail. Both wore shields emblazoned with the device of their masters, a myriad of evil green eyes watching in all directions. The guards pointed with their spears, indicating that the fox should follow them, and Fortunata fell in step, marching off to the long, dank hall. They halted in front of two large oaken doors, which swung open as the ferret banged their spear butts against the floor. The vixen was confronted by a scene of ruined grandeur. Candles and torches scarcely illuminated the room. The crossbeams were above, perfectly lost in the darkness. At one end, there were three ornate chairs, occupied by two wild cats and a mine, a piled mortar. Behind these stood four poster beds, complete with tight drawn curtains of musty green velvet, its footboard carved with the same device as the shields of the guards. The Martin hobbled across and searched the satchel Fortunata carried. The vixen shrank from contact with the barely disfigured creature. Ashleg the Martin had a wooden leg and his entire body was whisked, twisted on one side as if it had been badly made. To disguise this, he wore an overlong red cloak trimmed with wood pigeon feathers. With an expert flick, he turned the contents of the satchel out to onto the floor. It was the usual jumble of herbs, roots, leaves, and mosses carried by a healer fox. Approaching the bed, Ashleg called out in an eerie sing-song dirge. O oh, mighty Rodarkman, lord of the moss flower, master of the thousand eyes, slayer of the enemies, ruler of Kosha. Oh! Give your whining tongue of rest, Ashley. Is the fox here? Get these suffocating curtains out of my way. The imperious voice from behind the curtain sounded hoarse, with full of snarling menace. Yalmina, the larger of the two seated wildcats, sprang forward, sweeping back the dusty bed curtains in a single move. Fortunatus here. Don't exert yourself, father. The vixen slid to the bedside with practiced ease examined her savage patient. Rodolfo of the Thousand Eyes had once been the mightiest warlord of all the land. Once. Now his muscle and sinew lay wasted upon the tawny fur that covered his big, tired body. The face was that of a wildcat who had survived many battles. The pointed ears stood above a tracery of old scars that ran from crown to whiskers. Fortunata looked at the fierce and yellow teeth. The green barbarian eyes still alight with strange fire. My lord looks better today, yes. None the better for your worthless mumbled jumble fox. The smaller of the two seated wildcats rose from his chair with an expression of concern upon his gentle face. Father, stay calm. Fortunata is trying hard to get you well again. Sarmina pushed him aside scornfully. Oh, shut up. Gingerbeer, you mealy mouth. Sarmina! Rodago pulled himself into a sitting position and pulled a claw at his headstone daughter. Don't talk to your brother in that way, do you hear me? The Lord of the Thousand Eyes turned warily to his only son. Gingerveer, don't let her bully you. Stand up to her son. Gingerveer shrugged and stood silently as Fortunata ground herbs with a pestle, mixing them with dark liquid in a horn beaker. Rodolfo hides the vixen suspiciously. No more leeches, fuck. I won't have those filthy slugs sucking my blood. I'd sooner an enemy's sword cut me than those foul things. Where's that rubbish you're concocting? Fortunata smiled winningly. Sire, this is a harmless potion made from the herb motherwort. It will help you to sleep. Squire Gingerveer, would you give this to your father, please? As Gingerveer administered the medicine to Vodaga, neither of them noticed the look of slyness or the wink that passed between Fortunata and Slamina. Her daughter settled back into bed and waited for the door to take effect. Suddenly, the peace was broken by a loud commotion from outside. The double doors burst open wide. Chapter 3 
Ben Stickle nearly jumped out of his spikes as North bounded from behind a snow-laden bush in the nighttime forest. Boo! Guess who? Ha-ha, Ben, me old matey, you should have seen your face just then. What are you doing trekking around here in the snow? Ben recovered himself quickly. North, I might have known. Listen, young fellow, me mouse, I haven't got time to stop and gossip with you. We've got to get to this settlement at last, and I'm looking for the little hut that the quorum keep for the likes of us. The mouse thief winked at Earthclaw and kissed Goody cheekily. Ha! That place, follow me, matey. I'll have you there in two shakes of a cat's whisker. Goody shuddered. I wish you wouldn't say things like that, you little rogue. But North was not listening. He was skipping ahead with the little ones, who thought it was all a huge adventure. It is a nice place, Mr. North. Oh, passable. Better than the last place you were in. What's that under your jerkin, Mr. North? Never mind you now, young Spike. It's a secret. He's very far, Mr. North. I'm tired. Not far now. Posey me, little dear. I'd carry you if it wasn't for your spikes. Goody Stickle shook her head and smiled. She had always a soft spot for North. The Coram hut was well hidden, deep enough into the forest to avoid immediate discovery. Earthclaw said his goodbyes and trundled off to find his own kind. Ben watched him as go as North to lit the fire. He nodded fondly. Good old Earthclaw, he only stayed at the settlement because of us. I'm sure of it. When the fire was burning red, Goody sat around it with North and Ben. The four baby hedgehogs poked their snouts from under the blankets to one side of the hearth. Have you been stealing from Carter again, North? What did you pinch this time? The mouse thief laughed at Goody's shocked expression. He threw a wedge of cheese over to the little ones. It's not pinching or stealing if it comes out of cotter, mateys. It's called liberating. Here, get your whiskers around that lot and get some sleep. The four of you. Ben Stickle sucked on an empty pipe and stirred the burning logs with a branch. Noth, I do wish you'd be more careful. We can live on what we have until spring arrives. Goody and I would never forgive ourselves if you got caught taking cheese and wine from in that cat's castle. Good wife Stickle wiped her eyes on her flowery pinafore. No more we wouldn't, you young scallywags. On my spikes, I dread to think what'd happen if those vermin captured you, Gnoff. Gnoff batted her very carefully. There, there, Goody. What's a bite of food and a warm drink without mateys? The young uns need their nourishment. Besides, how could I ever forget the way that you and Ben brought me up and cared for me when I was only a little woodland orphan? Ben took a sip from the wine and shook his head. You be careful all the same and remember what the quorum rule is. Bide your time and don't let him catch you. One day we'll win old Mossflower back. Goody sighed as she went about making porridge for the next morning's breakfast. Fine words, but we're peaceable creatures. How are we ever going to win our land back against all these trained soldiers is beyond me. Nuff topped Ben Stickle's beaker with elderberry wine and gazed into the flickering flames his normally cheerful trace grim. I'll tell you this, mateys, the day will come when something will happen to change all of this. You wait and see. Some creature who isn't afraid of anything will arrive in Mossflower, and when that day arrives, we'll be ready. We'll pay that filthy gang of vermin and their wildcat masters back so hard they'll think the sky is falling on them. Ben rubbed his eyes tiredly. A hero, eh? Funny you should say that. I thought I saw one earlier tonight. Ah, he's probably dead in the dungeons by now. Let's get them sleep. I'm bone weary. The little hut was an island of warmth and safety in the night, as the howling north wind drove snowflakes before it, whining and keening around the gaunt trees of winter-stricken mossflower. Chapter 4 Struggling wild in between two stoats, the captive mouse was dragged into the bedchamber. He was secured by a long rope, which the guards had tried to keep taut as he jogged and jumped, scratched and bit, first letting the rope go slack, then dashing forward so the two guards would pull together. As they collided and leaped upon him, biting and kicking despite the rope, they pinned his paws to the sides. A ferret guard from the door came running in to help. Between the three of them, they managed to pin the warlike mouse upon the floor. They lay atop of him, laying to avoid the butting head and nipping teeth. 
The mouse was breathing heavily, his eyes flashing reckless, defiance of his captors. Vidogo sat up straight, sleep forgotten, as he questioned the two stoats. Make your report. What have we got here? One of the stoats freed his paw and threw a click salute. Lord, this one was caught within the bounds of your land. He is a stranger and goes armed. A weasel marched in and placed the traveler's ancient rusty sword at the foot of the bed. Vidogo looked from behind looted blood at the sword and the sturdy young mouth upon the floor. It is against my law to carry arms or to tread apart upon my domain. The mouse struggled against his captors, shouting in a loud, angry voice, I didn't know it was your land, cat. Tell your guards to take their claws off and release me. You have no right to imprison a freedom creature. Verdogo could not help but admire the obvious courage of the prisoner. He was about to speak when Tsarmina grasped the battered sword and stood over the captive with the point at his throat. You insolent scum! Quick now, what is your name? Where did you steal this rusty relic? As the guards pinned the struggling mouse down, his voice shook with fury. My name is Martin the Warrior. That sword was once my father's. Now it is mine. I come and go as I please, cat. Is this the welcome you show, travelers? Sarmina shoot, forced Martin hand back with the sword point. For a mouse, you have far too much to say to your betters, she said contemptuously. You are in Morflower County now. All the land you see is on a clear day's march belongs to us by right of conquest. My father's law says that none are allowed to go armed, save his soldiers. The penalty for those who break the law is death. She beckoned the guards with a sleek cat-like movement. Take him away and execute him. Lord Green Eye's voice halted the guards as he turned to his son. Gingerfear, have you nothing to say? What shall we do with this mouse? Some say that ignorance of the law is no excuse, Gingerfear answered, without raising his voice. Even so, it would be unjust to punish Martin. He is a stranger and could not be expected to know of our laws. Also, it would be all too easy for us to slay him. He seems an honest creature to me. If it were my decision, I would have had him escorted from our territory, then given his weapon. He should know better than to come back again. Vidogo looked from son to daughter. Now I will give you my decision. There are enough cowards in the world without killing a brave creature for so little reason. This Martin is a true warrior. On the other side of the scales, if we were to allow him to roam as free as the wind to on our land, this might be read as a sign of our weakness. It is my judgment that he be put in the cells to cool his paws a while. After a time he can be set free, provided he is never again so rash as to trespass in our domain. Snap! Everyone present heard the sharp report. Furious at being overruled, Sarmina had set the sword between the jamb of the door and the stone doorway. With a huge burst of energy, she threw her weight against the venerable weapon. Suddenly it broke. The old blade rang upon the floor, leaving her holding the shorn-off handle, which she tossed to a guard. Here, take him and throw him in the cells with this tied around his neck. If ever we do release him, then others will see him and realize how merciful we can be. Take the wretch away. The sight of him offends my eyes. As the guard tugged on upon the rope, Martin stuck, resisting them. For a moment his eyes met those of Sarmina's. His voice was clear and unafraid. Your father has just made a decision, but yours was the right one. You should have killed me when you had the chance, because I vow that I will slay you one day. The spell was broken. The guards hauled on the ropes, dragging Martin off to the cells. In the silence that followed, Sarmina slumped in her chair and sniggered. A mouse kill me? Indeed, he's not even worth worrying about. Verdago coughed painfully. He lay back on the pillows. If you think that, daughter, then you have made a grave mistake. I have seen courage before. It comes in all shapes and sizes. Just because he is a mouse does not make him less of a warder than me. He has a fighter's heart. I saw it in his eyes. Sarmina ignored her father and called to Fortunata. Vixen! Mix Lord Green Eyes a stronger potion. He needs his sleep after all the excitement. Gingerbeer, give father his medicine. 
You are the only one he will take it from. Fortunata gave Gingerveer the beaker containing the prepared draught. Salmina nodded to her, and they left the room together. Outside the corridor, the wildcat gripped the fox paw in her powerful claws. Well, did you fix the medicine? Fortunata winced in pain as the claws sank in. Twice, once before the mouse came in, and now, just now, before we left. He's taken enough poison to lay half the garrison low. Salmina pulled the vixen close, her cruel eyes burning. Good, but if he's still alive in the morning, you had better prepare for him for yourself. It would be a lot easier than facing me if you fail. The cells were deep between Carter. They were ancient, smelly, dark, and dank. Martin the warrior was hurled into his prison by the two guards that had dragged him down passage and stairway. He had fought every inch of the way, and they were glad to be rid of him. Martin lay with his cheek resting upon the cold stone floor where he had been flung. As the door clanged shut behind him, one of the stouts purred through the grating, turning the key in the lock. Thank your luck as stars, Mouse. If Lady Salmina had had her way, you'd be in the darkest, wettest cells further down in the passage. It was Lord Greeneye's wish that you shouldn't be put in such a bad cell, I, and given bread and water to eat, and some dry straw to lie on. Huh? He must have taken a shine to you. He's a strange one, old the dog is. Martin lay still, listening until the sounds of the guard's heavy paws had receded and he was alone. Standing up, he took stock of his new surroundings. At least there was light coming in from a torch that had burned on the far corridor wall. Feeling a slight drought, he looked up. There was a high, narrow grill sifted into the wall near the ceiling. Martin changed position, still looking upward, till he could see a star shining outside the night sky. It was his only link with freedom and the outside world. He sat, resting his back against the wall, huddling down in his ragged cloak to gain a little warmth. The rest of his cell was just the same as any prison. Four bare wells and precious little else. No comfort or cheer to be gained from anything here. He was a prisoner, alone in a strange place. The warrior mouse slept, overcome by weariness. Some time before dawn, he was wakened by paws thrusting something over his head and around his neck. Still half asleep, Martin tried to grab hold of his assailants. He was roughly kicked to one side. Then the door changed shut as the key turned in the lock again. Leaping up, Martin ran to the door. The stoat guard peered through the grating, chuckling and waggling a paw at him. You nearly had me there, Mouse! The warrior Mouse gave an angry snarl and leapt at the grating. But the stoat backed off, grinning at his futile attempt. Listen, Mouse, if I were you, I'd keep pretty quiet down there. Otherwise, you might attract Lady Zalmina's attention, and I don't think you'd like that. You'd just sit tight and behave yourself, and maybe in time someone like Gingerville will remember that you're here and you'll be released. As the guards trooped off, Martin saw that they had had a load of clean straw in one corner and some bread and water. He instinctively moved towards it and felt something clunk against his chest. It was the sword handle dangling from a piece of rope around his neck. Martin held it in front of his eyes, staring hard and long. He would wear it, not because he had been sentenced to it as a march of shame, but to remind himself that one day he would slay the evil cat who had broken his father's blade. Settling down into the dry straw, he drank water and gnawed upon the snail bread hungrily. He was about to fall asleep again when shouts and commotion broke out on the stairs. Pulling himself level with the door grill, Martin listened to the sounds that echoed in the silence of the cells. My Lord Green Eyes is dead! Lady Sarmina, come quick, it's your father. There were large stampings of spear butts and the sound of mailed paws dashing hither and thither, coupled with the slamming of doors. Sarmina's voice could hear be heard in an anguished wail. Murder, murder, my father is slain. Ashleg and Fortalata took up the cry. Murder, Gingerville has poisoned Vidarga. A tremendous hubbub had broken out. Martin could not hear clearly what was going on. A moment later, there was sound of heavy paw steps on the stairs. It sounded like a great number of creatures. Martin pulled to one side of the grill and saw it all. 
Led to by Salmina, a mob of soldiers carrying torches marched down the corridor, Ashleg and Fortunata visible among them. As they passed through the cell door, Martin glimpsed the stunned face of the gentle wildcat Gingiver. He was browned in chains. Blood trickled down from a wound in his head. Their eyes met for a second. Then he was swept in a surge of angry soldiers, their face distorted by the flickering torchlight as they chanted, Murderer! Murderer! Kill the murderer! Martin could no longer see them owing to the limited range of his vision through the grill, but he could still hear all that went on. Some distance down the tour door, a cell door slammed and a key turned. Sarmina's voice rose above the noise. Silence! I will say that what is to be done here. Even though my brother is a murderer, I cannot harm him. He will stay locked up here until he lives out his days. He is now dead to me. I never want to hear his name spoken again within the walls of Kauta. Martin heard Gingerveer's voice trying to say something, but it was immediately drowned out by Ashleg and Fortunata starting a chant. The soldiers took up at full pitch. Long live Queen Sarmina! Long live Queen Sarmina! As the mob passed by Martin's cell again, he drew back. Above the roars, he heard Sarmina close to the door, speaking to Ashlag. Bring October ale and elderberry wine from the storerooms. See that there is plenty for everyone. Shutting his ears against the sounds of the revelers, Martin lay down upon the straw with a sword handle pressing against his chest. Now that his last hopes were gone, it Chapter seemed like five. a long hard way. Across the lea, beneath the leaves, when country lands to wake up to spring. Hurrah, here comes the prince of these, hear every small bird sing. So daring and so handsome, too, he makes a wondrous sight. But if he comes to visit you, lock up your treasures tight. Sunlight sprinkled upon the chuckling stream that had lain iced over and silent all day. Snowdrops nodded agreeably to crocus upon the warm southerly breeze. Spring was everywhere. Golden daffodils and their pale and narcissus relatives stood guard between the budding trees of mothflower wood. Evergreens that had endured the dark winter look are too fresh life. North was returning with another successful visit to Carter. The wine flask bumped and banged against his broad belt as he skipped nimbly along the flowering woodlands, singing aloud with the heady intoxication of springtime. Cuckoo, cuckoo, my good day to you. Sly one you know best. To lay in others' nest is a trick you often do, but I am smarter, sir, than you. Cuckoo, my friend, cuckoo. The blood coursed madly through Noth's young veins like the waters of a brook, gurgling happily and generally making him so light-headed that he turned somersaults. Every so often he would pull a reed flute from his tunic and twiddle away with the sheer joy of being alive on such a morning as this. With a great whoop, Nuff threw himself into a thick tussock of grass and lay with the perspiration rising from him in a small column of steam. Overhead was a delicate blue with small white clouds scuttling on the breeze. Nuff imagined what it would be like to lie upon a small fluffy white cloud and allow himself to be buffeted about in the sunny sky. Whoa, look out, zoom, bump, woof! Out of the way, you big clouds! Little mouse thief held tight to the grass, swaying from side to side as he played out his game of make believe. He did not notice the two weasels dressed in kosher armor until too late. They stood over him looking grim and officious. Noff smiled infinitely, aware of his clunking wine flask. Uh, <laughs> hello, mateys, I was flying my cloud, you see. The larger of the two prodded him with a spear bust. Come on, you, on your paws. You're wanted at Carter. North winked at him cheerily. Carter, you don't say. Well, how nice. Well, listen, you two good chaps. Nip along and tell them I'm busy today, but I'll pop in early tomorrow. The spear point at North's throat discouraged further light banter. The smaller of the two weasels kicked Noff. Up you come, thief. Now we know where with the best cheeses and the elderberry wine have been going all winter. You pay for stealing from Carter. Noff stood slowly, placing a paw on his plump little stomach. He took from one guard to the other with an air of innocence. Me? Steal? I beg your pardon, sir. Did you know I was the head cook had given me permission to borrow what I pleased from his larder? Actually, I was going to return the favor by sending him some good recipes. I understand his cooking leaves something to be desired. 
The large weasel laughed mirthlessly. Shall I tell you something, thief? The head cook has personally vowed to skin you with a rusty knife and roast what's left of you for supper. North nodded appreciatively. Oh, good, I hope he saved some for me. Ouch! Parted between two spears, he marched off with the guards in the direction of Carter. A pale shaft of sunlight penetrated between the iron bars of the high window slit. The walls of the cell dripped moisture, and sometimes the faint trill of a skylark on the flatlands had reached the prisoner. Martin knew that this was the onset of full, bridgening springtime. His face was haggard, his body much thinner, but his eyes shone with the warrior's angry brightness. Martin rose and paced the cell with the sword handle about his neck. It seemed to grow heavier with time, fifteen paces, whichever way he went, from door to wall, from wall to wall. It was always fifteen paces. He had paced it many times, and the days and the weeks grew into months. Gingerville was too far away to converse with. Besides, it only made the guards angry. They stopped the bread and water for attempting to speak with one who is named with befitted defension. Now Martin believed he had really been forgotten and stood here to die under the new regime of Zalmina. He stood in the shafts of weak sunlight, trying not to think of the world of blue skies and flowers outside. Get the little devil in there quick. It'll be less trouble to feed two at once. Ouch, my shin! Lost in thought, Martin had failed to hear the approach of God bringing a prisoner to his cell door. Ah, let go my ear, you fiend! Hurry up with that door before he bites my lug clean off. Out! Ow! He nipped me! Keep him still where I find my key. There was more shouting and scuffling as the key was turned in the lock. Martin ran to the door, but he was immediately bowled over by another figure, who shot through the doorway straight on top of him. Together they fell backward as the cell door slammed shut again. The two prisoners laid still under the poor steps of the guards, retreated down the corridor. Martin moved gingerly, easing the body had fallen on top of him. It giggled. He pulled his cellmate into the shaft of sunlight where he could see him more clearly. North winked at him broadly, played a short jig on his reed flute, then began singing. I knew a mouse in prison here more than a hundred years. His whiskers grew along the ground and right back to his ears. His eyes grew dim, his feet fell out, his row was silver gray. If I, my granddad, were here, he wondered what he'd say. Martin leaned against the wall. He could not help smiling at his odd little cellmate. Silly, how could the grandfather of a hundred-year-old mouse say anything? Sorry, my name's Martin the Warrior. What's yours? North extended a paw. Martin the Warrior, eh? By gum, Martin, you're a fine, strong-looking fellow, even though you could do with a bit of fattening up. My name's North the Thief, or Prince of Mouse Thieves to you, matey. Martin shook Moth's name warmly by the paw. Prince of Mouse Thieves, by the fur you could be the king of the sky as long as I've got a spellmate to keep to. What did they throw you in here for? North winced. Stop squeezing my paw to bits and I'll tell you. They sat down on the straw together, North massaging his paw. They caught me running larder stalks of wine and cheese, you see. Well, don't you worry, matey. I can open any lock in Carter. We won't be here for too long, you'll see. Leave it enough. You mean what you can, we can. Escape from here? How? Where? When to? <laughs> Martin's voice tumbled out, shaking with excitement. North fell back against the wall, laughing. Well, matey, not so fast. Don't worry, once I get things organized, we'll be bye-bye to this dump. But first, we'll get you to bed. We should be ashamed of ourselves keeping a great lump like you on bread and water. Martin shamed and rubbed his yellow stomach. Oh, what else is there? I was lucky to find bread and water sometimes. What do you suggest? Fresh milk and oat cakes? Sorry, matey, I ain't got milk or oat cakes. And what would cheese and elder butter wine do you? He asked seriously. Martin was lost for words as Moth opened his tunic and spilled a wedge of cheese and a flat canteen of wine. I wish to keep these for emergencies and trading. Here, you might as well have it. I've had enough of cheese and wine for a bit. Martin needed no second bidding. He wolfed away at the cheese, sipping a wine, gulping it as he wolped into his full mouth. North shook his head in wonder as the wine and cheese vapid rapidly. 
how easy it makes it. You'll make yourself ill. Take your time. Martin tried hard to get the good advice, but it was difficult after so long on starvation rations. As he ate, he questioned Goff. Tell me, what have I walked into around here north? I'm only a lone warrior passing through. I know nothing of moss flower and wildcat. The mouse thrashed his whiskers reflectively. Now, let me see, where to begin? Since long before I was born, the old tyrant of the dog of green eyes, lord of the thousand singer gummies, and so on, has ruled over Mothflower. One day long ago, he swept in the air with the head of his army. They came down from the north, of course. The forces must have been what attracted him. To woodlanders, it was nothing more than an old ruin that had always been there. The dog saw it differently, though. This was a place of plenty where he could settle. So he moved straight in, repaired it as best he could, called the place Cowser, and set him up himself as up to the tyrant. There was none to oppose him. The woodlanders were peaceable creatures. They had never seen a firm army of trained soldiers nor wildcats. The dog could do just as he pleased, but he was clever, and he allowed the creatures to live within his shadow and farm the land. Half of everything they produced was taken as a tax to feed him and his vermin. Didn't anyone fight back, Martin interrupted. North nodded sadly. Oh, yes, even though there were old ones who were too still fright to tell them how Vodoga and his crew daughter put down the old organized rebellion, those who were not massacred were thrown into this very prison and left to rot. I'm told my old parents were among them, but I don't know the truth of it. When the rebellion was broken, Vodoga proved what a clever general he was. He actually made a kind of peace with the woodlanders. They were allowed to live within cottage shadow and farm the land. He said he would protect us as further attacks by bands wandering down from the north. We were partly enslaved then and very much disorganized, not having very pretty, 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 pranks, <coughs> proper fighting strength, and with all the rebellion's fighters out of the way, most creatures seemed just to accept their lot. Then last summer the dog became ill. Since he had been sick, he had left the running of this settlement to his daughter, Sarmina. Unlike her father, she is cruel and evil. Woodlanders have been driven too far hard out on the fields and not allowed to live on. Hedgehogs like Ben Stickle and his family near not run away. Where could they go with young ones to care for? However, Things became so bad that many took the chance and escaped from the settlement. As the numbers grew less, Sarmina de demanded more and more from the few. I'll tell you, matey, it's a sad tale. They sat side by side, watching the shaft of sunlight striking the cell door. Martin passed the wine to North. What do you know about the wildcat named Gingerville? North took a sip of the wine and passed it back. I know he never took part in any killing. Woodlanders would only hope that Vodaga would pass the reins from him. He's supposed to be a good sort for a wildcat. That is, now you take the sister, Sarmina. She is pure evil. They say that she is far more savage than Vodaga. I have heard the gossip around Carter when I say they've been visiting Matey. Do you know, they say old Green Eyes is dead and his son is prison here. So, that Miss Salmina must be the new reeler now. Martin nodded. It's true. I saw and heard it myself. Gingerview is in a cell far down the corridor. I tried to speak to him, but it's too far away. The warrior mouse banged his paw against the wall in frustration. Why doesn't something do somebody? No. The mouse thief sapped on his nose and lowered his voice. Sit still and listen, matey. Now, the last families have left the settlement. We'll be talking plans. All the scattered families in Woodland is banded together out there in more flower woods. They're learning to become strong once more. And the old spirit of defeat is gone now. We have real fighters training. Otters and squirrels. Behind hedgehogs, moles, and the likes of me. We've even got a badger. Bella of Brockhole. Her family used to rule more flower in the good old days. You'll like her. Together we form the Council of Resistance in Mothflower. Gorum, me, look at the first letter of each word. 
Ha! We're getting stronger every day! Martin felt the excitement rising in him again. Do you think the Corum know we're locked here? Will they help us to escape? North winked broadly, a sly grin upon his face. Shh! Not so loud, matey! Wait and see! He passed the wine flask back to Martin. Tell me something, matey. How you call you a warrior? Where are you from? Don't you live in a place like Mossflower? Was it nice? Martin put the wine to one side and lay back, staring at the ceiling. Where I come from, North, there are no forests, only rocks, grass, and hills. Aye, that's the Northland. I never knew a mother. I was brought up by my father, Luke the warrior. My family have always been warriors. We've lived in caves, constantly under attack by roaming bands of sea rats who came inland. You were forced to defend your cave, your piece of land, or be overrun. There were no families, other families like us. I had lots of friends. There was Throg the Strong, Arrowtail, Feldo the Wrestler, Timbalisto. Martin smiled at the memory of his companions. Ah, it wasn't so bad, I suppose. All we seemed to do was eat, sleep, and fight in those days, as I, as soon as I was tall enough to lift my father's sword and practice with it. He touched the broken weapon strung about his neck. Many's the enemy that learned his lesson at the point of the sword. Sea rats, mercenary foxes, too. One time my father was wounded and had to stay in the cave. Ha! I remember all that summer fighting off foes while he lay at the cave entrance preparing our food and calling advice to me. Then one day he took off with a band of older warriors to meet the sea rats on the shores of the waters far away. They were supposed to make an end to all invading wrath forever. It was a brave idea. Before he left, he left me his trusty old sword. Then, carrying a spear and shield, my father said that I should stay behind and defend our cave and land. But if he did not return by late autumn, then I was to do as I felt fit. North nodded, and he never returned? Martin closed his eyes. No, he never came back. I defended our land alone against all comers. That was when they started calling me Martin the Warrior instead of Son of Luke the Warrior. I left it as late as I could that autumn. There seemed no point in defending a cave and land just for myself. I started to march south alone. Who knows how far I would have got if it hadn't stopped at Cotter. North stood up again and stretched. I'm glad you did stop here, Maisie. I'd hate to be sitting in this cell talking to myself. I'd sooner talk to a warrior like you. Martin looked as he passed the wine back. Aye, and I'd sooner be locked up with a thief like yourself than wandering alone, Chapter Maisie. Six. It was strange that the very moment North and Martin were discussing Corum, the council of that name was talking of them. Ben Stickle's humble home was crammed with woodland creatures the largest of whom was a badger, Bella of Brockhall. She presided over the meeting, also present were the Skipper of Otters, Lady Amber, the Squirrel Chief, Ben Stickle, and Billiam, a dependable mole who was deputizing for his leader. Seated by the fire, Beast the Squirrel answered council questions. Where did you see North captured? Westerly, over near the fringe by Cotter, Wherever was Gnorf going to let himself get captured? Oh, the usual, skylarking and fooling about. You say it was two of Vidaga's soldiers. I had no doubt about that, in uniform and carrying spears. Well, where were you all this took place, Beach? Sitting up an old oak not far off. Or did you hear what they said? Heard him say that they were taking him off to Cotter. Of course, you know, Gnorf. Treated it like a big joke he did. No doubt they'll have wiped the silly grin off of his whiskers by now down in their old green eyes cell. Lady Amber nodded at Beach. Well done. Anything else to report? No, Marm. I followed them as far as I could. Then I spotted Aguilar perched in a spruce. Couldn't say if he was awake, so I decided to come back here knowing there was a gathering of quorum. Ben Stickle weeped at Beach. I slate down, too. Here's a pot of spring vegetable soup, cheese, and nut bread. You'd think we could manage some beach? The squirrel winked back at Ben, bobbed his head respectfully to the quorum leaders, and was gone before further questions could be thought up. Bella rubbed huge paws across her eyes and sat back with a grunt of despair. Well, 
Here's another pretty pickle our mouse thief has gotten himself into. Any suggestions? Amber clucked disapprovingly. If I had my way, I'd live the silly creature to stew his paws and caught her a while. That did to teach him a lesson. There were murmurs of agreement. The skipper of otters whacked his rudder-like tail against the hearth. Belay that type of talk, mates. You all know the little ones were gone hungry many of the times, except the thief. Skipper gave a good-natured chuckle. That north is my kind of mouse and a true messmate. A bit like the paw, but good-natured and able-bodied shanty singer. Ben Stickle raised the paw. I vote we rescue north. We'd be ashamed to call ourselves true woodlanders, leaving one of our own in Cotter Prison. Billiam lifted a velvety paw. Hord, do you more vote count more travels more vote not your? Bella thought for a moment while they all digested the meaning of the rustic mole speech. Of course, Billiam. After all, you are four moles, deputy, and the quorum respects your judgment as a sensible mole. Billiam squinted his round eyes with pleasure at the compliment. By a show of pause, the vote to rescue Noff was unanimous. Then there were a temporary respite for refreshment, while the assembly helped themselves to bowls of good wife Stickle's famed spring vegetable soup barrels of warm nut bread and ripe yellow cheese. Lady Amber smiled fondly at two little hedgehogs who were trying to look very fierce and brave, knowing she was always ready to recruit warriors into her band. She dealt with them as they were two bold squirrels. Show me your paws. Hmm. You'd probably make good climbers after some training. You certainly look tough enough. Goody, are these two young villains very strong? Good wife put her down her ladle and wiped her paws on the apron. Oh, my, yes, Ferdy. Ferdy and Cogs are two of the strongest. Why, you wouldn't believe your eyes if you saw these two a-gathering up all the great heavy dishes and washing pots. There's no two hogs more powerful. Much smiling and winking was in evidence as Ferdy and Cogs gathered bowls, grunting with exertion as they proved their strength by scouring a huge cauldron between them. Buckling down to the business of North, the quorum set about planning his escape. Ardgalar had returned to Mossflower. No creature could say why he had deserted in Mountain Stronghold in the far west. Maybe it's that he had enjoyed the comfort of woodlands, where prey was far more plentiful. Ardgalar was a golden eagle of great age. He had grown too slow and short-sighted to pursue small creatures, so staying within handy range of Cotter and Verdaga's troops suited him. But the frightening strength and savagery of an eagle had not disturbed it, Ogdalar. And the chance of a larger animal coming his way, he took it. With curving talons and fierce honked beak, ferrets, rats, weasels, stoats made good eating. And besides, there was a pine marten living in Cotter. Admittedly, it was a bit battered and bent, but Ogdalar had never tasted pine marten before, and was determined that one day he would do so. The eagle and the wildcats had crossed trails many times over the years. Each had a healthy respect for the other. With the addition of Sarmina, whenever Aguilar was sighted circling the sky over Cotter, Verdaga's daughter incited the soldiers to fire arrows and throw stones at the great bird, offering rewards for the creature that could bring him down. Aguilar was not unduly worried by a mob of vermin tossing missiles at him, as he could outdistance anything they could choose to throw. Sometimes he would hover over a thermal, slightly out of range, trying with his failing eyesight to catch a glimpse of the desired Martin or Sarmina, whom he hated. Bright spring sunlight warmed his wings as he wheeled above the fortress. Ashleg cringed as he, behind his wildcat mistress as he stood upward at the soaring eagle. Shoot, you fool! Not over there, idiots! There, see, right above your thick heads! The soldiers continued firing without success. Sarmina grabbed a particularly slow ferret and cuffed him soundly about the head. Hurling the smarting creature to one side, she picked up his bow and notched an arrow to the string. Taking careful aim, she paused for a moment as the eagle swooped lower. Swiftly, she loosed the barbed shaft with a powerful hiss of flighted feathers. To the surprise of the watchers, Argular wheeled up one side and shot upward in pursuit of the arrow. Up he went until the shaft had reached the peak of flight, then wheeling quickly inward, the eagle caught the arrow in his talon and contemptuously slapped it. 
Zooming downward, he flew low enough to stare for a second at Sarmina, then beat the air with massive wing strokes, flying away into the blue yonder. Sarmina would never have vented her rage upon Ashlyn. But he had vanished inside when the eagle saw diving. Get out of my sight, you useless lot of buffoons! The soldiers followed Ashleg with all speed, each trying not to be last as Sarmina was in the mood for making examples. The wildcat stood alone, pondering a question. Where had she seen that same look of vengeance and fearless before? The mouse, was it? She could not even recall his name, anyhow. He probably hadn't lasted the winter down in the cells. Sarmina had watched a furtive anger coming across the parade ground, ducking and weaving, flattening itself in the shadows. She snorted scornfully. It was only Fortunata. Frightened of a blind old eagle, Vixen. Milady, I was ducking the arrows and stones of your soldiers as they came down, but that was a good shot of yours, Fortunata said, in a fawning voice. A pity that the eagle caught it in midair. The vixen jumped sharply to the side as Sarmina fired an arrow from the ferret's bow. It landed at her feet where the, where her paw had been a moment before. Sarmina notched another arrow, her eyes glinting cruelly. Right, let's see what you're best at, fox. Catching arrows or getting inside with a civil tongue in your head. She bent the bow back and giggled wickedly at the sight of Fortunata beaking hardship retreat. Sooner or later, the Queen of the Thousand Eyes had the final say in all things. Something rattled through the slit window above Martin and Noth. In the semi-gloom, they groped in the straw until Noth found the object. Martin could not conceal his disappointment. Goodness me, a stick! How helpful! We could take this place single board with a stick. What a useful thing to send us! It was not a stick. Noth ignored his cellmate and set about undoing the thin wire bound to the bark parchment along the slim blade. He unfolded the parchment and moved into the light, where he read the message aloud it contained. Noth, here are your tools. Leave by the woodland side of Cotter at the first light of dawn. We will be waiting to cover for you. Corin. Noth laughed quietly as he destroyed the message. This is what we've been waiting for, matey. Of course they don't know about you. The plan is only supposed to cover my escape, but don't worry, we'll sort it out. The cancer will be glad to have a real trained warrior on their side. Now, you see this little bit of wire and this silly little knife blade? Well, they're going to get us out of here, matey. These are the tools of an honorable thief. Martin clasped Noth's paw warmly. I'm sorry, Noth. All I did was stand here making stupid remarks. You are the expert. From now on, you have an assistant who is willing to learn from your experience. In fact, you've got a real mate, matey. Noth laughed and winced at the same time. Right how, matey. The first lesson is not to break the expert's paw by crushing it because you don't know your own strength. Now let's settle down now. When's the next guard patrol due? In about an hour's time as regular this clockwork since I've been here. After that, there'll be nobody until two hours after dawn when they bring the bread and water. Good. That gives us time for a little rest, Noth said, stretching out comfortably on the straw. Martin lay down, willing himself to relax against the flood tide of excitement building the fire. Noth played and flute a while, then began singing softly. Pick a lock, pick a lock, you'll regret the day when you took a mouse thief and locked him away. Silly cat, look at that, two for one. The thief and the warrior by dawn will be gone. Martin lay with his eyes closed, listening. Who taught you that song? Noth struggled as she packed this flute away. Nobody. Sometimes songs just spring into my head. Silly, isn't it? Sometimes old Goody Stickle says it's more flowers singing through me. Now and then she'll say it's a sight of seasons the sun hasn't shone upon. Martin savored the phrase as they lay in the straw. A sight of seasons the sun yet hasn't shone upon. Eh, I like that, matey. Your friends sure sound like nice creatures. Noth chewed on the straw. You'd like Goody Stickle. If I had a mother one time, she couldn't be any nicer than Goody. Wait until you taste her spring vegetable soup, or her oat and honey scones, piping hot with oozing butter, or her apple and blackberry pudding with rices and fresh cream, 
Why, you, you new yellow cheese with hot oven bread and a stick of fresh celery, aye, and a bowl of milk with nutmeg grated on top of it. The straw slipped from Snuff's lips. Martin was glad he had dozed off. After all that delicious mention of food had set his mouth watering like a stream. He was in fact positive that he should like Goody Stickle. In fact, he should never be short of a constant admirer if her cooking was half as good as Noth described. Chapter 7 It was still three hours to dawn as the rescue party headed by Amber and Skipper left the Stickle dwelling. Goody pressed parcels of food upon them, clucking worriedly. Now I don't want to hear of anyone getting themselves a catcher by these mad cats. They'll eat you for sure. Amber the Squirrel Chief smiled as she hefted a pack of food. Don't fret your spines, Goody. We're more than likely to be laid low by the amount of rations you're about to make us take than an enemy. Skipper peeked inside his pack. Mom, my old stomach would sink in a stream if I ate half of this. I'd be down to the bows for a week. The small band of tough, capable woodlanders were Paul picked from Amber's squirrel archers and Skipper's otter crew. They stood about checking weapons. The otters swirled swings and selected stones, many of them balancing light-throwing javelins. The squirrels waxed bowstrings and belted on full quivers. Ben Stickle remarked to his wife, As fine a body of woodlanders as I'd seen, let's hope they can be of help to our little moth. Verdi and Krog strolled out to join the band. The two small hedgehogs wore cooking pot helmets and blanket cloaks. Each carried a piece of firewood, and they scowled in a warlike manner as they stood among the squirrels and otters. The skipper of otters clapped a paw to his brow and staggered about in mock fright. Strike me colors if it ain't two bloodthirsty savages. One glance at these two would put a wildcat off his skilly on duff for life. Ferdy and Clog strutted about, tripping on their blankets but still managing to maintain fierce grimaces. Concealing a smile, Lady Amber took the two would-be warriors by their paws and positioned them outside the stickle house. They placed on one side of the doorway, where they stood scowling and stabbing at the air with their firewood weapons. The otter and squirrel band dutifully scowled back in recognition of their two foul fighters. Skipper gave them a broad wink and waved his muscular tail for silence. Belay the gab and listen to me now. These here rough-looking coves have offered to spill some blood and guts all over culture. But what I say is, leave the easy work to us. We'll manage that. What I need is two ruffians who'll stop at nothing to patrol around this cottage and guard it while we're gone. I'll tell you, otters and squirrel, tis hard and dangerous work. So I'll leave my packet of tuck to keep you two villains alive while you're on watch here. That's if you think you can manage the job. Ferdy and Cog stood to attention, spikes bristling, cheeks puffed out with authority, practically bustling with enthusiasm. They saluted officiously as the rescue party moved on in the direction of Cotter. Amber sniffed a light breeze, not more than two hours to daybreak now. Skipper wound a slingshot about his paw. Aye, Marm, that'll give us enough time if we move along handy. On the fringe of Mothflower, Cotter stood dark, and forbidding the very embodiment of evil and tyranny awaiting the dawn. Martin stood bolt upright at the sound of a bird on the outside. He, snuffed, he shook Noth soundly. Wake up, sleepyhead. It'll be dawn in less than an hour. The mouse thief sat up, rubbing his paws into his half-opened eyes. He looked upward to the narrow strip of sky through the barrel window slit. Time to go, matey. Noth took his slim knife blade, sliding it into the keyhole of the cell door. He twitched it back and forth. How oh, good, an easy one. With both eyes and a smile of pleasure on his face, he jiggled the blade until there was a metallic click. That's it, matey, give it a shove. Martin pushed the door, but it refused to open. It's still shut. What's gone wrong? Noff texted it carefully, pushing until he heard a slight rattle. Bolts. It'll need a boost. Can you hold me up, matey? Martin braced his back against the door, cupped his paws, and squared his shoulders. Try me. The mouse thief climbed up and balanced on his friend's shoulders. Martin bore his weight patiently, hoping that Noth's talents would do the trick. How does it look up there? he asked anxiously. Noth's voice came back punctuated by odd grunts of concentration. 
No real problems, matey. Least of ways, nothing that a princess thieves can't handle. Ha! Rusty old bolts. Shove a bit of greasy cheese on it with my knife blade. Loop the wire around the ball hander. Then it's just another wigger and jigger and tug till it comes loose like this one. Ha! Got it! Martin squared his shoulders once more as North sought a new position. Now for the other lock. He Just be scrabbling and crumbling up doors. A good strong mate to stand on. Martin, you're as solid as a rock. Maybe, Martin grunted. But I'm not as thick as one. So stop prancing about on the back of my neck like that. I've been standing here for ages. North was never short of an answer. Ages, huh? You've not been there ten seconds, and the job's near done. I've known clumsy thieves and burglars who would keep you there until you grew way whiskers. Thank your lucky stars you got an honest thief like me to look after you, matey. Look out, here it goes. Suddenly the door swung open, and they both tumbled in a heap out into the passage. North was laughing uproariously. Martin cut the ear across his noisy friend's mouth. Shh, you'll have the guards coming down to check on the din. Martin closed the door carefully and rebolted it. North was halfway through the passage when he noticed Martin was not with him. Glancing back, he saw his friend standing in the cell far by the corridor. It was Gingerbeer's cell, and Martin was speaking to the wildcat. Gingerbeer, do you remember me? I'm Martin the Warrior. When I was taken here prisoner, you were the only one who tried to help me. I've not forgotten that, even though we're on opposite sides. I've got to go now, but if there is a way I can help you when I'm free, then I will. Gingerbeer's voice reached Martin. He sounded weak and despairing. Save yourself, Martin. Get far away from this place and my sister. North pulled Martin away, calling as he went. I'm North, the Prince of Mouse Thieves. we got to go now, but if you help my friend, then I'll try to help you someday. As they hurried along the corridor, Gingerbeer's voice echoed behind. Thank you. Good fortune go with both of my friends. They reached the passage and mounted the stairs. North was panting slightly, so N Martin waited while he regained his breath. The stairs were built in the spiral. At the top was a wooden door. North held a paw for silence as he eased it open. It was all clear. They stepped out into a broad hallway which stretched to the left and to the right of them. Martin scratched his head. Which way, left or right? North placed his slim blade on the floor and spun it. They stood watching until it stopped. Left. Come on, then, matey. Continuing along the hallway, they saw a high window with the morning sunlight streaming through onto the top of a flat, wide stairway. North groaned. Oh, no. We're late. We've missed time because of that dark cell. Oh, well, if we hurry, they may be still waiting outside for us. Which way now? As the steps took a turn, they were in a smaller hall with a door on either end. The sound of Salmina's voice could be heard. They froze. If one word of this ever gets out, just one, you vixen and you ash legs, I'll see you both hanged and changed over a roasting pit. The army will only follow the rightful leader. And now that my brother is in the cells, that's me. I am queen of the Thousand Eyes. I rule Cotter and Mossflower. The escapers backed down onto the stairway as they had just ascended, the echoes of Sarmita's voice all around them as they ran around the turn of the steps. Martin and North crashed straight into Sarmina, Ashleg and Fortunata, who had unknowingly been walking up the stairs behind them. In the shrubs and small trees that bordered the woodland edge of Cotter, the otters and squirrels lay low. It was full bright morning, long past the dawn. Birds were singing. The sun beamed over bright greenery dotted with Daphne, Spurge Laurel, and late winter jasmine. Oblivious to the beauty of round them, Skipper lay, whispering to Amber, We can't hang the anchor around here much longer, Mom. Amber stared at Carter's gloomy walls. You're right, Skip. We could easily be sprouted in broad daylight from those walls quite easily. Where in the name of the fur that has that gotten that little thief off to? We could only give him a little longer, Skipper, shrugged resignedly. Then we'll have to push off and try another day. A long, dark-colored otter came wriggling through the grass on his stomach and saluted them. Oh, you're never going to believe this, Skip, but there's a whole fleet of mice dressed in funny-looking robes coming this way through the woods. 
Never seen orcs like it in all me born days. Skipper and Amber look quizzically at the scout. Where? Sort of circling around the south. Look, there. Sure enough, he had spoken truly. Through, a, uh, through the trees, a band of mice was marching, all dressed in green-brown robes, complete with cowls and rope ties around the middle. Amber shook her head in amazement. She shook to another squirrel by a nearby tree. Quickly, take this otter with you. Get over and tell that bunch of ninnies to get down flat. Don't they know where they are? Before the pair dashed off, Skipper spoke. Stay with them. As soon as it's safe, take them in low. Go to Brock Hall. That should be large enough. Get in touch with Bella. Tell her all about them. Say that me and Lady Amber will be in touch before nightfall. Off you go. Amber watched them bound away, ducking and weaving. Beside the Andre and Cotter, there was only Argelar to watch out for. She turned to Skipper. What a bright bunch of boobies. Imagine parading around Cotter in broad daylight. Where do you suppose they came from? The otter snorted. Search me. Bella will probably know as soon as she's done a few far roaming in her time. Oh, talk of the time. I think it's nearly run out for near Goff if he doesn't show up soon. If he... Ooh. Even at this morning hour, the warmth from the sun had lulled old Augillard into a drowsy sleep. The eagle perched high in a spruce, partially leaning against the trunk. In his sleep, he groaned pleasurably, ruffling his plumage slightly to let in the glorious warmth seep through to his ancient flesh and cold bones. If only there was a place that had no cold winter or damp, windy autumn, just eternal spring followed by summer. Life passed Argelar as by he slept, by his perch. It passed, more importantly, in the forms of an otter and squirrel leading a band of robed mice directly beneath the very tree where he slumbered. It would have been hard to tell who was more surprised, the escaping prisoner or the wildcat and her minion. Immediately they collided. Zormina gave a yowl of rage, and more by luck than judgment, seized Noth's leg. This was followed by a more anguished yowl, as Martin whipped a blade from Noth's belt and stabbed Zormina sharply in the paw, forcing her to release his friend. Follow me! Martin grabbed Noth and ran back up the stairs, giving Fortunata a good slash across the rump with the blade as he went. The vixen collided with Ashley, and they fell in a jumble. Zarmina tripped over them. She struggled to extricate herself, screaming curses and raking the unlucky pair with her claws. Rockheads, idiots, get out of my way! Martin and Noth dashed headlong into the hall. Talking door to the right, they dived inside, slamming it shut behind them. It was the late Lord Greeneye's bedchamber. With the shouts of their pursuers ringing closer, the escapers scuttled for cover beneath the large canopy bed. We can't stay here long, Martin panted, as he felt about in the darkness and found Noth's paw. Don't worry, matey. Get ready to make a boat when I shout. There was no further opportunity for conversation as the door banged open. Zarmina pushed her creatures before her and closed the door. She was licking her wounded paw. Fortunata, who had suffered a loss of dignity, tried not to rub at her wounded rump. Ashleg stumped about, trying to sound helpful. At least we know we've got him cornered in here somewhere. Somewhere, echoed Fortunata. But where? Zarmina lowered her voice as she called the other two close. We don't know how much these mice overheard. They must not leave this room alive. Let us search every corner thoroughly. Stretched out flat underneath the bed, Martin could see the paws of their pursuers. He watched as he dispersed in different directions, then turned toward Noth. In the name of mice, that little thief was the absolute limit. Noth had actually closed his eyes and appeared to be napping. Martin prodded him urgently. The three hunters were getting closer to the bed as the other hiding places were discounted. Ashley, had you checked those wall hangings properly? Yes, my lady. Maybe they're up on top of the bed canopy. The pine martin was actually leaning against the side of the bed now. North patted Martin reassuredly as he wriggled silently past him. The warrior mouse could only watch in dumb suspense as his daring little friend went to work. North carefully pulled the end of Ashley's long cloak beneath the bed, 
flitted it expertly with his blade and crawled a short way beneath the bedhead, where tall, heavy, folding screens stood to one side. Working quickly, he tied the slit ends of the unsuspecting Martin's cloak around one leg of the screen. Noff did three things almost in one movement. He picked Ashleg's good paw viciously with his blade, grabbed Martin and shot from beneath the bed, roaring as they went. There they go! Stop them! Pandemonium ensued. Ashleg screamed and lurched forward. The heavy screen went with him. It tottered and fell. Zamina managed to leap out of the way, but the vixen was not so lucky. She was struck by the screen. Half stunned, she pushed it away. The cumbersome screen toppled sideways into the fireplace, falling directly onto the grate, which held the embers of a previous night's fire. In trice, the room was a thick cloaking of mess of ashes, cinders, and dust, and smoldering embers. Martin and Noff pushed the door open. The two weasel guards who had heard the noise in passing came thundering into the room as Martin and Noff hurried past them out into the hall. Beyond them the shouts reached a crescendo as unprotected paws came into contact with a floor strewn with red-hot embers. This time Martin took the lead as they went straight down the hall and through the door on the opposite end. They found themselves in an upper mess room full of soldiers, stoats, ferrets, and weasels, all eating breakfast at a long trestle table with a window at one end. Taken completely by surprise, the soldiers sat gaping at the two fugitives. Stop those mice! Kill them! Zalmina's enraged shouts reached them as she ran towards the mess. North sized up the situation at a glance. The unexpected was called for. Without a second thought, he pulled Martin with him. They ran across the room, bounded from a vacant seat up into the tabletop, and dashed madly across it, scattering food, drink, and vessels everywhere as they went. Together the thief and the warrior leapt through the open window into the empty space with a loud, defiant shout. Yeah! Skipper and Amber both heard the cry. So did Aguilar. It came from the north side of Cotter, not far from where the Woodlander Squirrel Scout stood perched on the tree. He bounded down and made his report to Amber. It's north, but there's another mouse with him. They jumped from the upper barracks window. We better get around here. Are they hurt? No, but talk about lucky. They landed right in the foliage of a big old yew growing on that side. Amber leapt up. Get Beach and the others. We'll have to bring them out of here double quick. Skipper, you bring the crew and give us cover. Aguilar launched himself from his spruce, flapping ponderously. Once he was airborne, his natural grace and ability took over. Circling to gain height, he squinted over to where the sounds had come from. The ewe's upper foliage was shaking. The eagle scored downwards to see if there was anything edible. Inside the mess room, Sarmini laid about herself with a sturdy wooden ladle. Don't stand gawping, you did witted toads. Someone got out here and captured them. There was an immediate stampede to grab weapons and buckle armor on. No one seemed disposed to leap out the window, though they all tried to look as if they were helping in some way. Sarmina lailed the ladle around in a fury. Suddenly, a bright young stoat, more reckless than his comrades, saw a chance to distinguish himself in the eyes of his mistress. He bounded up onto the table. Leave it to me, milady. I'll stop them. Striking a gallant pose, the stoat ran to the window ledge and stood nerving himself for the leap. Augular stood low, close to the yew. His roomy eyes could not distinguish much about the crisscross branches. He was about to abandon hope of a quick meal and turning from his huge wingspan, when suddenly a fat, juicy stoat with an expression of heroic beauty upon his face jumped out into midair, straight into the talons of the wheeling eagle. Aguilar gave a screech of delight, which contrasted jarringly with the stoat's ragged squeal of dismay. The old eagle flapped joyfully off to his spruce banks with his tasty burden. Noff wiped perspiration from his whiskers. In the name of mice and crab apples, that big fella nearly had us, matey. Martin looked at the open window. It's not over yet. Look. Sarmina stood glaring over them. The mess was crowded with frightened creatures, none of whom would venture near the window. Ashleg shuddered and clutched his clammy fur. Did you see those claws? Ugh, the size of its beak! Sarmina swung him around by his cloak. Shut your blathering face and get me my blow and arrows. Just look at them for a prize piece of impudence. Noff was pulling faces at the wild-dead cat queen. 
He blew out his cheeks, stuck a paw to his nose, and rolled his eyes in the most ridiculous manner. Salmina snatched up a spear and flung it, but the weapon was deflected by the close-knit yew branches. A well-aimed arrow would do the trick, she thought. Where's that dithering wooden leg and my bow and arrows? Eight sturdy red squirrels came bounding through the yew branches as easily as walking a paved path. They split into two groups of four, each taking the lead of two escapers. Lady Amber came swinging in. She spoke sternly to North. Now none of your shenanigans, young thief. You, whoever you are, just relax and leave the rest to us. You're in safe paw. Before he could say a word, Martin was seized by paws and tail. He felt himself tossed about like a shuttlecock. Never in his life had he descended from a height so swiftly or with such ease. It was like being a flower petal on a gentle breeze, and a trice he and Knopf were on firm ground. A horde of armed soldiers poured out of Cotter. A Martin saw, thought about for a weapon, anything to defend himself with. There was a whirring sound, and the first four soldiers running seemed to relax, lying down upon the grass as if they were taking a nap. Two more went down. Martin saw a line of otters with swinging slings. They were hurling large river pebbles with deadly accuracy. A large, burly otter came running to them. Noth clapped his strong, tattooed paw. Skipper, I knew me old messmate would leave his favorite thief in the lurch. Oh, by the way, this is Martin the Warrior. He's my friend, you know. Skipper signaled his crew to retreat, wait, waiting to lady, at Lady Amber as he fitted another stone to his slingshot. Ha! Welcome aboard, Martin. So, an old fellow like you came to be mixed up with all this little buccaneer. I don't know. The skipper introduced Martin to Lady Amber, who said rapidly, glancing around at her, Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. Martin, skipper, I don't like this. They're planning something. As Amber spoke, a horde of soldiers bearing thousand-eyed shields came streaming out of the main door with Salmina leading them. There were too many to contend with. Amber muttered to Skipper, Take Martin and North, break and run for it. We'll cover you. Salmina was furious. She guessed what was happening. The squirrels were taking a stand while the otters slipped off into Mossflower with the fugitives. She issued orders to a fair captain named Raker, Stop here with a platoon and face the squirrels. I'll take the rest and circle around them. We'll cut them off. They won't realize I'm following, so they'll slow down a bit when they think we're in the clear. Raker saluted. As you say, my lady, here you, Scratch and you, Thicktail, take your squads and follow the queen. The two weasel captains saluted with their spears, then detailed the creatures to follow Salmina. The wildcat had bounded off alone, taking a wild loop south and back east. Nothing aggravated Raker and more than a squirrel-resistance fighter. They were like smoke in a breeze, here and gone. He took aim and heaved his spear at their leader, but it was a complete waste of time. Amber stood back dryly, twirling her sling and chucking as he let the spear graze harmlessly past. Directing her troops back across open ground, she loosed a heavy pebble at tremendous speed. Raker threw his shield up in the nick of time, staggering backward as the stone struck his shield and bounced off. While the ferret lowered his shield, it was as if there was never a squirrel inside Cotter's ground. They were gone to a moss flower. High in the branches of the trees that fringed the woodland, squirrels looked with silent laughter at the dumbfounded expression on Raker's face. He shook a mailed paw at the trees. Come out and fight, you cowards! One last thunderous hail of stones, arrows, and javelins sent the culture soldiery scurrying for cover. The treetops rustled and swayed. Distant laughter told the enemy that the squirrels were swinging away through the sunlight upper terraces of leafy moss flower. Chapter 8 Bella of Brockhold's huge striped face lit up with pleasure. Well, this is a rare and unexpected pleasure, Abbas Germain. Come in, all of you. Welcome to Brockhall. Abbas Germain led the brothers and sisters of Lomhens into Bella's ancestral home, down the long, twisting passage into the massive cave-like main hall, whose ceiling was the arched roots of the great oak above Brockhall. They made themselves at home ab above the wide hearth, whilst Bula the otter and Pear the squirrel, 
who had acted as their guide, explained to Bella what had taken place. The badger had listened carefully, settling back in her old armchair. I had an idea something like this would happen. That's why I'd left Goody Stickle and came home here. Nothing ever goes as planned with Noth. Still, not to worry, that young rip will be right as rain. You'll see. First things first. Let's get you all fed. You must be famished. I was baking a batch of chestnut bread. It'll be ready soon. I'll make some celery and fennel stew with hazelnut dumplings and get a cheese up from the storeroom. Now stop looking noble, the pair of you. I know what growing otters and squirrels are like. You can wait here after you've eaten until the rest come back. Fetch bowls from the shelf for our guests. That's it. Make yourselves useful. Eagerly the woodlanders did as they were bid. Then they sat at the loam hedge brothers and sisters. Bella rose and embraced Abbas Germain. My old friend, we were many summers together younger when we last ate together. The Abbas placed a thin, worn paw on, over Bearley's hoary pad. Yes, the seasons are born anew. But alas, as we go older, my friend. But not you, Germain, Bella chuckled. You look as young as ever. What news of Lomhenge? The abbess could not prevent a tear trickling onto her gray whiskers. Lomhenge, what magic in that name. But the happy times there are gone like leaves down a stream. You heard of the great sickness? Bella nodded. I had heard something from travelers, but I thought it the far south. I did not think it had found its way to your home. Germain shook and closed her eyes as if trying to ward off the memory. Only those you see here escaped. It was horrible. Everything it touched withered and died. I could not. Bella patted the old mouse gently. There, there. No need to say more. Try to forget it. You can call my home your own, for you and your mice, as long as you like. And please don't thank me. You'd do exactly the same as I if I needed shelter. In fact, you did many years ago when I was young and liked to travel. The two old friends went to the kitchen and began preparing the meal. Bella told Germain that all had taken place in Nothal. This is a sad and oppressed place you have come to, though once it was happy under the rule of my father, Bored the Fighter. I was still young then. I returned from our wanderings in Falkstrike. He was my mate. We met far to the southeast and returned to stay with my father at Brockhall. I think that my father was waiting for this to happen. My mother was long ago gone to the gates of the dark forest. She died when I was a cub. War the fighter was a good father, but a restless spirit. He had tired of ruling Mothflower and wanted to go questing, just as his father, old Lord Brocktree, did before him. One day he left there, and Barkstripe ruled in his stead. Those were good seasons. We had a cub, a little male called Sunflash, because of his four stripes, which had an odd golden tinge. He was a sturdy little fellow. In the autumn of that year the wildcats arrived. The dog and his brood took over that old ruin of a fortress. There was no one to oppose him, and he brought with him a vast horde of wicked vermin. At first we tried to fight back, but they were so cruel and merciless that they completely crushed us. Barkstrike led a great attack upon Cotter, but he was slain, along with many others. Those who did not escape into Mothflower were caught and left to rot in Verdaga's prison. Alas, that was all long ago. We have learned to keep ourselves safe here in the thick woodlands now. Germain drew loaves from the oven on a long paddle. Where's your son, Sunflash? He must be quite big now. Bella paused as she laid the bread to cool. While I was ill and grieving for Barkstrike, our stun stole out of here one night. They say he went to Cotter to avenge his father's death, but he was far too young. Sunflash has never been seen or heard since. Many, many seasons have gone by since then, so I think that one way or another my son ended up at the, da the gates of the dark forest with his father. Outside in Mothflower, the afternoon shadows began to lengthen over the trees that were budding and leafing, promising a thick emerald foliage for the summer. In another part of Mothflower, not far from Cotter, a mailed tunic and tabard bearing the thousand-eyed device 
slipped carelessly from a high spruce branch and landed in a crumpled heap on the forest floor. Ard Galar shifted from claw to claw as he preened his pinions, carefully arranging his long wing feathers. A good fout stoat would be extremely welcome, but Pine Martin, ah, that was a delight he had yet to savor. Argular would wait. His time would come. A Martin with a wooden leg could only run so fast in any direction. The eagle snuggled down into his plumage, glad that the spring nights were kind to young and old alike. It was good to visit old hunting grounds again.